Um, welcome to today's Safe Havens Freedoms Talk. Um, my name is Ibel Ramirez, and I will be moderating today's conversations. Uh, today's talk will engage in conversations on how archival interventions by choice or necessity can offer pathways for reflection, uh, preservation of local histories, as well as, as a space for subversive resistance, in particularly at the personal or hyperlocal level. I'm really happy to be joined today by artists, archivists, and memory workers, Lesia Chalka and Leah Dostiera. Um, I wanted us to have a conversation on how archives and our archival interventions can challenge power. While my research focus is within diasporic archives, in particular relating to indigenous communities in the Americas, I can see overlap amongst the three of us um, whose work and in many cases lived personal experiences consider archives, memory, as bridges to displace and ancestral lands as a result of past and ongoing colonial and imperial projects. The Lara diasporas originally originate largely due to colonialism. I am a Vaimara and Quechua descendant from Coyasuyo, which is present-day Bolivia, but I'm speaking to you from present-day Detroit, um, also the Antita territory of the Anishinaabe who includes the Three Fires Confederacy of the Obijue, Ottawa, and Botawami peoples here in the United States. In a recent panel, Dr. Alain Pelas Lopez, an Afro-Indigenous scholar and poet, reminded us that much of forced migration, whether in the Global South here in the Western Hemisphere or within the United States, Trail of Tears, Dawes Act, Transatlantic Slavery, has always been a part of colonialism. However, said communities have made such records too. In fact, historical omission from the official record has long been part of an intentional long legacy of targeted uh, epistemological violence towards marginalized communities. In essence, records and archives are expressions of power relationships that are socially mediated, or as archivist Dominique Lester describes, assertions of power. So how do archivists, memory workers, artists, and others within this work center the specific constructions and negotiations of memory of the sociopolitical context tethered to how records are created? What conversations, actions need to take place for local histories, nuances, and local preservation practices to be honored and incorporated in this work? These are all questions I look forward to talking about today with both of you. Um, but to kick off our conversation, um, Leslie and Leah will guide us through visual presentations of their respective work in relation to archives and memory. Um, so Lesia, we'll start with you um, for your presentation. I work with historical identity, social and political memory. Я вчилася у мастацькій школі, але вищу адукацію отримала у галіні соціальної психології. І у 2017 році я заснувала архів Веха, який працює з сімейними фотоархівами. Це альтернативний і відкритий архів, який існує зараз тільки в форматі онлайн. Мы собираем тематичные фотоздымки из приватных коллекций и архивов и додаем э, их у наш архив, объединяя одной темой, проводим доследования и выдаем книги. Первый такой проект – это «Найлепший бог», который э, адлюстровывает жизнь межвоенного периода. На фотоздымках вы видите людей э, у складанный исторический период, а Яны делают фотоздымки с э, своего наилепшего боку на фоне тканых даванов. Это такая спроба имитовать фотоздымок у студий, которые были фотостудии, которые были только у городах. Но тут на их этих фотоздымках мы бачим жихаров белорусской вёски. Вот у 2018 году была издана первая э, фотокнига с фотоздымками из этой коллекции. Эм, 
Гроші на нього збирали спрос крауд-компанію. Тоді у 2018 році це було ще можливо в Білорусі. Наступна книга. Наступний проєкт називається «Дівочий вечір і опошній фотоздимок». Гэта портреты, сделанные на фоне тканых диванов. У этом проекте э, приняло вельми шмат людей у дел. У нас э, у коллекции Амаль э, 2000 фотоздымков. И как бы эти фотоздымки адлюстровывают визуальную историю Беларуси 20-го века. Эти два сюжета, веселье и похование, были наичастей документованы, и тому у большей колькости заковались у семейных фотоархивов. Мы сделали несколько выставок с этими фотоснимками, так само выдали двухтомник у 21-м году в Беларуси за властные сродки, и эти вот фотоснимки не все, а наилепшая такая частка, около 300, трапили у эту книгу. И опошний проект — это «Люди леса». Это фотоздымки э, белорусов, их узадно, взаимоотносимо э, с дикой природой и лесом. Так само на минулом тыдне была выдана книжка але уже в Польше. Неким судом час иде. Вот мы протягиваем працу, собираем фотоздымки и створаем такой незалежный архив. Я же могу додать, что зараз не знахожусь у Беларуси. Я была вымышлена съехать у 21-м году после своего затримания и турмы. И про спиритичный переслед я сейчас нахожусь у иммиграции и працую, а кроме фотосдымков семейных, так само над архивом протеста у моей краины. Спасибо. Okay. Thank you so much, Lesia. Um, and now I'll give the floor to Leah. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so, uh, I'm Lia Dosliv, I'm an artist. Uh, I also have some background in cultural anthropology. Uh, I'm originally from Donetsk, from Eastern Ukraine. Uh, now this city is occupied by Russia. Uh, so when I moved out uh, because of war, I started naturally uh, to work with uh, collective trauma and war in my art practice. Uh, but then, then I brought it my perspective. And now uh, also together with my co-author Andrei Dostle, we work on collective traumas, historical traumas and wars in general. And I want to share with you one of our projects which is actually based on archive we stumbled upon. Let me start sharing. Okay. Uh, am I sharing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're sharing. Uh, great. So uh, this project is called Black and Percent Blue. And it started actually with an archive. In a very specific archive uh, when I was on artistic residency in Vienna uh, a few years ago. Uh, some family I know invited me over a dinner and they asked then asked me if they can show me something, if they can uh, share their family archive with, you, with me. But it was very specific archive. Uh, it was an archive of uh, some person uh, who was a father of uh, a person who invited me over. Uh, and this person was uh, 
as owner and uh, of archive. Uh, he was a soldier who served in Luftwaffe during the Second World War. And uh, his family wanted uh, uh, to share this archive with artists and give us uh, an, an opportunity to like, think about what can be done with this material, how can we work with it. Uh, and believe me, it was a very massive body of knowledge, historical knowledge, because uh, this guy who went to fight, uh, he uh, brought his camera with him and he like documented uh, like every every place he went to. Uh, also, this uh, archive has very uh, like uh, specific tags, places, dates. And what was uh, very, uh, very interesting about this archive is that when uh, the soldier went to East, uh, I mean, uh, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, also some parts of Russia, he would take pictures like here. Uh, it was ground, soil, dirt, like nothing, just soil as a resource. Mostly, I mean, it's just one uh, one page, but I mean, there are hundreds of pictures like that. And then also he had some breaks, some vacations, and for that he went to West. And there he would take pictures like that. I mean, beautiful pictures of buildings of architecture, you know, culture, civilization, something beautiful, uh, something based on culture and knowledge. And also what was very specific about this archive that you can barely find any traces of actual war. I mean, ruins, dead people, uh, something really bad. No, nothing, just some places and beautiful pictures of Western civilization, like here. And then when he went back to the front, like here. Uh, so we decided that maybe we can understand that uh, archive as uh, perpetrator's case, you know, because uh, mostly when we talk about archives, we talk about point of view of victims or, or oppressed people, oppressed categories. But this archive was something very else. Uh, so we started to think about what we can do with that. Because I mean, it's nice to have an access to archive. Uh, it could be many things. It could be a source of historical knowledge, for example. But when you're an artist, you have to like, create something from it. So we uh, decided uh, to recreate pictures some of them, some photos we saw in, archive, in this archive uh, with actual soil, I mean, literally. Uh, and we created some number of pictures uh, from this Eastern region. Uh, they are all mixed. It's, uh, this particular one, I think, is from Ukraine, near Odessa, but there are also um, Poland, uh, Belarus, Russia, as well, it's obviously mixed, because for him it was like, you know, uh, big land on the east, which is more like soil and resource and some things that have to be uh, taken over uh, with some occasional people in it, with some occasional buildings somewhere in the ground. Uh, but mostly it was about this like ground and so as a resource, uh, yeah, as a part of land. And like this. And also like this. Uh, 
and more of them. And also you know, uh, later added these traces of blue paint uh, because uh, also what we work with is absent. And sometimes it's much more telling than objects that are in the picture. Uh, because in this photo, in, like in this whole body of archive, uh, there, there were very little mentions of war. I mean, there was something like three or four pictures with actual ruins, uh, but no more, and no traces of Holocaust, for example, nothing like that. Uh, never a dead person, nothing like that. So we added these blue traces to show that on one hand, it's like sky, and sky is blue, and the guy's talking to uh, So he spent a uh, big amount of time up there. But also, if you saw uh, pictures from gas chambers, uh, uh, there are some like, light blue traces of gas because uh, this gas uh, produced this kind of blue paint. So also we wanted to mark the space of absence with some presence, presence of atrocities. Uh, and they're like not here in the frame, but they are still here. Yeah, and also we added those beautiful architectural pictures uh, from Paris and from other uh, places. That's a good job. Yeah, that's how it looks uh, in space. Uh, we printed them like really small. And this is picture made from soil. And also we added some video to this project because, I mean, nothing is happening here in this video. Uh, it just sound uh, following the picture uh, to add this notion, just understand this feeling of time and also of like, you know, soil or dirt or something new. You can touch and something you can uh, feel as um, you know as the ground. Yeah, I think I think this is all from my side, and maybe we can discuss later. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Um, thank you so much, Lydia, for and Lysia for your presentations, and um, I look forward to talking a little bit more about um, both of your works. Um, now, now as we transition to the to the to the conversation phase, so um, I like I had passed on some of the questions uh, that I wanted to kind of also talk about uh, this uh, today. I guess one of the questions that kind of kicking this off was sort of thinking about you know how both of you are using archival interventions. Um, and, and you know, you both talked about it a little bit already um, in your presentations, but how is that kind of taking place in your artistic practice? Um, or how does that really, how is that grounded in your own local identities, uh, networks, you know, that's part of, you know, your practice or also maybe cultural memory traditions rooted in history or ge geo localities. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, maybe uh, Lesia, you want to start and then we can go with Leah. Okay. Um, так, ну, по перше, і то офіційна політика пам'яті у Білорусі, вона сьогодні побудована на совєтському ресентименті. Тобто після розвалу СССР у нас не було іншого президента, тільки один, який якби подавав усю свою політику і ідентичність у бок э, некого культурного об'єднання з Росією. Э, тому пріоритети пам'яті віддавались у якби, темі Другої Сусвітної війни або Совєтському Союзу. І амаліше усі інші в області спадщини, 
не выходили у интересы державные и не финансировались. То бы как они основали, идя к учетовке культурным активистам и активистам памяти. За архивами и больше складанная ситуация, потому что, например, большая частка архивов э, она закрыта для людей. Например, архивы КДБ с документацией репрессий до этого часа засекречены. И люди практически не имеют э, доступа до своей истории и документов памяти. Ну и праца с минулым ясно никак не стимулируется. Вот, и мета э, архива века была именно процедурить увагу обычных людей до своей собственной истории, э, показать ее важность у истории супольности, процедурить с историей студенности. Мы выбрали тому, что это один доступный инструмент у нас в этот момент, процедурить с тем, что мы имеем. И вот, например, э, Наш остальный проект, как сказать, про ландшафты, это был проект «Люди леса», про лес, который занимает 40 отсотков территории Беларуси. Ну, именно это уплывает на формирование и идентичности, и наших взаимоотношений. Так. I think it's two different, very different stories, uh, pre-war, pre-2014, and now. Uh, because when we're talking about authenticity, uh, it means that you have an access to something, right? That you can actually work with your archive, you can hold in your hands and open these photos as a physical object. It, and now it became very problematic because, for, for instance, my own personal archive, now is in Donetsk, it's occupied. I have no idea what happened there. And it's not only just about my identity, not about local identity, but about my Ukrainian story and story of my family in general, because my archive, my family albums started from the beginning of the 20th century. And I think the most earlier picture is even pre-revolution, probably late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So now it's lost technically. We don't know what's happening. I don't have any pictures like of my grandmother whom I still remember. And now it seems that like memory, like living memory is longer can like survive while some physical archives cannot. So I still remember people who are on the pictures which now are lost. And it's very problematic and I mean on very many levels, on historical level. For example, because uh, for, for example, uh, recently uh, by Russian shellings was destroyed uh, an archive of uh, you know, this criminal, criminal stuff uh, from uh, Soviet period. And now histor historians cannot work with it, it's lost. Because some parts were digi digitalized, some not. And uh, my role as an artist now, I think uh, to find a solution, to start to think in this direction, like, what we can do now, what can be done, how can we work with this very problematic situation when like real archive, real documentation is absent or we cannot get access to it. How can we like reimagine it? How can we work with this knowledge of archive, you know, with this idea of an archive, with this memory of something which is supposed to keep the memory, you know. Yeah, so it's now it's get more complicated, but I mean it's also very interesting that probably I prefer I would prefer you know not to not to have such an opportunity and this and this yeah.
situation. Um, yeah, um, thank you both um, listening and, and reading also um, your responses. I think, yeah, I think absolutely. Um, a lot of the times, like you're saying, Leah, and like you mentioned, Lesia, these sort of spaces, specifically when literally human, the humanity, you know, like of of the people of certain groups, um, is the point is for that for their destruction and obliteration, and that includes also language and and culture and etc. And so, what do you do, sort of, you know, when you either can physically access it, like you're kind of saying, Leah or it's been destroyed, or you're literally prohibited from, from even practicing it out loud. And so, and I think it's interesting how both of you, I think reading about your work um, and how you sort of, and your writings or, or looking at some of the, I, I think at the archive that you have, um, Lesia, how it's very much the personal um, or the family archive, I think has sort of been a, a common theme. And I think it's, you know, one thing that I said at the beginning was that a lot of the times, right, it's sort of these institutional or sort of like bigger kind of archives that even if they are in an essence existing, a lot of times they also have a lot of silences and are, and are, and are sort of uh, curated to kind of say a certain historical sort of recollection uh, to, to I guess, to uh, appease those in, in power. Um, and so I think I'm really interested also in my work in the personal or the family archive, you know, I think because it's a very unmediated or immediated also, right? Um, you know, I think allowing us to really witness our specific constructions and negotiations of memory, right? Um, thinking about it, right? Like uh, the archive, the, the Veja archive, right? And of photos of Belarusians like in the forest because of that connection with with nature, um, you know, and 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 maybe the tactile sort of you know of like being in a place and you know and and that sort of like sensory experiences of then reliving memories, right? And so I feel like the personal or family archive in some cases can sort of be that that kind of in some ways space that, that kind of witnesses these sort of kind of mediations happening with other objects, right, or photographs or or paper, or, you know, in my case, you know, dance is something that I think a lot about, you know, if I were to say, what's in your personal archive, what's in your family archive, I'd probably say, oh, like, probably, you know, dance steps, maybe photographs of dance steps of, you know, certain dances from, from Bolivia. So I think my next question, you know, I think, you know, kind of, yeah, why have both of you, I guess, and you kind of touched a little bit about this, like kind of what, why have both of you incorporated the familial or the personal archive a lot, you know, or maybe kind of what do you think that that sort of type of archive that actually a lot of the times is usually, you know, within professional archival studies, at least in the United States, is very much sort of put to the wayside and not, and kind of ignored. Um, why, why do you think maybe, why do you think that maybe this type of archive can sort of, um, you know, provide to the conversation, whether the cre a creative or maybe, you know, um, or just kind of archival conversation um, and how has it kind of manifested in your work, both of you? No, так, то есть питання абсолютно про сімейне, фотоархіви, і тут, звісно, у нас супрозлегла ситуація з Лії, абсолютно, тому що це одне з родок інформації, яку ми маємо, ми не маємо доступу до нашої історії, іншого, окрім тільки сімейного архіву. Але коли ти працюєш сімейним архівом, і можна сказати, що ми зробні такої приватної пам'яті, будь-яка історична подія має мисто голосів і міркування. І тому це дуже важливий фактор для якби, перспективи в ogóle історії. Тому що на узровні інституцій ці голоса і міркування не зникають і сплощуються тільки до нейкого нормативного символізму, який просто транслювати, але і також легко наповнити новими сенсами. Тому для мене будущее – це коли кожен і кожен становиться акторами, промовляючи свою історію і маючи доступ до архіву створяючи простору для дискусії і обміркування пам'яті, а не лепші подручники історії. 
I think uh, on a personal level for me, uh, my family archive is I remember it because as a child, I used to like, look through it very frequently. I mean, I loved to, you know, to touch it, to, to read all the small letters and photos, to ask questions about, okay, who's this guy? Who's this guy? Oh my God, grandfather, no way this is you because I mean, this man is so handsome, but wow. But I mean, it, it was my real impression because I discovered from these photos that my grandfather, whom I know like as an old man already, he was super handsome and was a young person. And uh, also for me, as archives could show a gap between official knowledge and family history, between what like, could be seen and what uh, is remaining hidden for a long time. Because as I started to talk about my grandfather, uh, he was born in 32nd, 1932nd. It's, this is the year when the great famine Holodomor in Ukraine started and my grandfather survived. But, uh, and. As I mentioned, he was super handsome. He like uh, got super good education in Kharkiv, uh, despite he was from small village in central Ukraine, which is which was really tough uh, in the 50s uh, in Soviet Ukraine. And then he moved to Donetsk when I was born, when my father was born, and when I was born. And I mean, for me, he was, uh, you know icon of success, I mean, this ideal man, it was him. And then, uh, uh, like a few years ago, uh, he wrote kind of memoir, kind of my memory, what I remembered. And he gave us all to read it, if we are okay with it, because also he mentioned us. I mean, he's still living, he's 90, but he still lives. Uh, and uh, and I started to read about his early years, and I was like, oh my God, he was like, okay, I survived Holodomor, but it influenced me so badly that I was ugly, I was unhappy, I was in poor health, and I mean, it's a man who still, even now, exercising twice a day. So, you, you know, this like picture, self image of person who like went through some kind of trauma and how, how can we see this person? It's very different. It's very different. And this giant gap between it, I think it's very telling. And also we cannot discover it when we just look at the pictures but i mean together with personal story i think it can work out very well yeah absolutely yeah i think um kind of right we can kind of make assumptions we can kind of make maybe even like kind of have in some ways sort of a incorrect interpretation what actually the person persons actually think of themselves and i think leah um, Leslie, I mean, in your um, written response that you sent over, I think you talk about also how um, in the level of family archives and, you know, even even that. So from what I understand, I think also sometimes it can even, you know, in some ways, like be also manipulated as well, right? Like it's also like sometimes not even like the the space of the family or personal archive is also um, absolvent of um, of sort of that, um, that maybe the institutional archive falls under consistently. Um, so, right. And I think that's why also sometimes, yeah, like we, it could be med it could be unmediated, the personal family archive, or it could be mediated, right? And so I think, yeah, and I think both of you in terms of it's not always very much so uh maybe yeah it's not so maybe like um perfect or maybe it, it kind of could you know use sort of like you know the accompaniment of stories or of of um, of of um the voices or of the of um 
narrations of, of folks themselves where we can also make assumptions too. So I thought that was really interesting that both of you say as well, because a lot of the times maybe, you know, one is sort of like praises the family archive or the personal archive, you know, as sort of as innocent or as sort of like, per, in, like with, with, the, with no per, imperfections, but, um, but it also, you know, can fall to that, to the manipulation or to maybe sometimes that. So I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, I don't know if, um, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm, Lee, um, Lee, I don't know if you can maybe, yeah, um, if you have anything to, based on what, um, let's say, I mean, Leah said that maybe you like to kind of respond, um, or what I said, uh, yeah. No, I mean, it's, this conversation is so broad that I can go in hours, I mean, so we really have to narrow it down and maybe I would mention, the, I mean, I started to talk about it, that I'm really interested in what's absent because a picture, I mean, a photograph as a medium is very limited. I mean, it has its own limitation and what is in the frame, it's sometimes not what is this all about. I mean, if we read it, you no know, Marian Hirsch or you know other people who wrote about Holocaust, we can. Uh, but all, also, what, what is very, 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 very like bad uh, that we also have the situation now based on our experience, and when we look at the photos of people who survived through some horrible events. Sometimes you cannot tell from their faces or their posture or their clothes that they have been through something. Yeah, I mean, uh, we read this uh, in Marianne Hirsch when he, uh, she wrote about uh, her relative who, uh, who survived uh, in a concentration camp and then it was a like, young woman. And then she took a picture and sent this picture to everyone just to let them know that she survived. And also there is this picture in the book and you can see just little uh, like uh, young girl standing near some tree and you cannot tell that she experienced some really bad things. And now my friend who like survived in Bucha and she's now in the United States on some scholarship. Uh, she's like, oh, you know, people tell me all the time, you look much more better than I would imagine based on your experience. I mean, you know, what kind of command is that? What kind of, you know, this, what's happening? Ага, ясно. І Лія, ти вже проводила якби порівняння з сучасними фотоздимками, так? Якби з під час війни вже зроблені. Ну, так, я можу так само додати, що якби такі старі фотоздимки, як уже сказала Лія, з були лімітовані, тобто це було недоступно для більшості людей, і ясно, їх було мало. Ну, і частіше за все вони повторяли різні такі сюжети і способи як би, фотографування. А, коли зараз, е, наприклад, е, казати про фотографію і її сенс, і у сучасному світі вплив, то Білорусь е, і штодзьодність Білорусі сьогодні, вона майже не документується. Тобто там немає незалежних меди, і у Стурми так само фотоздимки не можна ніяким образом достати. Тому ті події, репресії, які відбуваються, ми просто не можемо їх побачити. І тому не можемо е, би, ніяк виразити своє ставлення до того, що відбувається зараз. Лія, коли ласка, ти мені коли що допомагає, тому що складане доволі питання, і я аж трошки ухожу, ну, якби, може бути, нешто не додаю. Що... Ні, все окей, це було просто питання, чи ти можеш щось додати до того, що я там сказала, чи ти вийде якісь рефлексії. Все ок. Угу. Добре, дякую. Окей, дякую вам обох. Так, я думаю, що наступна питання, 
I kind of wanted to get more a little bit into kind of the um, artistic expression or the, the materiality. Um, and we started talking about like the limitations of materiality, like photographs, for example, right? So I think in the question that I asked, um, specifically thinking about communities that have sort of faced forced displacement um, and kind of how that affects maybe the, the characteristics spatially, temporally of how diasporas remember. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that kind of the dialogue between, so, you know, monomic systems and by monomic, I think sort of like, what are sort of the, the artifacts or the expressions that are kind of used in tandem with expressing a memory. Um, and so I, I'm interested, um, you know, in sort of how, how sort of this has this played out, you know, within your respective um, artistic expressions, um, its materiality um, when talking about memory. Um, and then also what are some limitations, which I think came up already in your conversation about, you know, family archives and the photograph. Um, and I think Leah, you, you said something really interesting, right? That a lot of the times, you know, an archive in itself, you know, it's can be sort of maybe stagnant or sort of, you know, kind of immobile and sort of kind of what are the, what, where it's sort of, there's a limitation of kind of like how you remember and you have to maybe be in a place and maybe, you know, touch or smell or hear, I don't know, you know, that's really sensory so that maybe, you know, arts or um, can kind of, can provide us. So, yeah, so I, I think that that's the question I'd love to ask both of you. Um, kind of how does materiality expression aid um, in this idea of uh, the archive and memory, but also what are the limitations of it as well? So maybe Leah, we can start with you and then go to Alessia. Uh, I mean, limitation, <laughs> I already <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> the main limitation is, is everything could be destroyed or taken from you. And it's also a situation uh, which mm -hmm. needs to be dealt with. And uh, when the Russian occupation started in 2014, uh, like we got this post to you know to think what could be done, what can we tell? And uh, a few years later, we created together with Isolatia in Kyiv uh, an exhibition. We called it uh, Reconstruction of Memory. Uh, we invited artists with this background of internal displacement or uh, who had to move out from the occupied territories to create something about what happened to them. Because at the moment, we were not sure how could we talk about what had happened. I mean, it's obviously an occupation. Obviously, the territory is lost. Obviously, people are suffering. But what had happened on you know, this like epistemological level? What language could be used in order to describe what happened? I mean, what we lost but not in terms of material like just you know stuff but in terms of memory in terms of identity in terms of you know personal continuity of personal history first of all yeah so we asked people to create something for us it was really interesting because we started this conversation obviously too early too early uh because a lot of people refused to take part in it because they were like no, no, it's too hurt. I cannot talk about it now. Sorry, get back later. Uh, and some people like recreated something for us. I mean, it was most obvious way to do, and it is that what we like implemented with this title reconstruction of memory. Um, but also, it was obvious that it's an attempt which would fail because how do you recreate a memory? It's impossible, right? Uh, so Andri Dosli, for example, he recreated his family album the way he remembered it. And it was just very raw collage, very like brutal, I would say, even like in purpose to, uh, to show this process of occupation, not just on level of territory, but also on the level of personal memory. And for this, he used... Uh, photos from anonymous uh, sources just from you know flea markets we could not tell who these people were we just can guess that they came from the same social background or you know yeah, also from 
this post-Soviet or something like that. This from like shared space, more or less. And we could guess. So as he said in this description, I occupied uh, memories of some people the way Russians occupied mine. Mm. Yeah, so he, it, this was his attempt to to think about what could be do can be done with this like lost materiality. And as for me, I tried to create like really long group photo. Uh, I just took this very long paper, like 20 meters of paper, and I was just like drawing the silhouettes without faces, just, you know, unrecognizable people who are standing or sitting together but you cannot recognize them. You cannot say who they were. You don't know their names. Because for me, this was like just, I tried to get this feeling of belonging just through this performance, I would say, because it took me something about like 12 hours. I don't remember, because, but it was quite uh, interesting, but somewhat painful experience because, you know, a wrist is hurting. Yeah, so, so yes, and also uh, some artists we invited to reconstruct the, their personal space because it also could be understood as part of archive, right? Like just in very, very literal sense, but, but anyway. Так, я тут абсолютно згодна з Лією питання про те, що це питання на час після війни. І коли казати, наприклад, про білоруську супольність і відносини, не відомо, з со світом, вогулі, і поміж собою, то я можу сказати, що до 20-го року Білорусі вогулі мало хто відомо. І мало хто відрізнив Білорусь і Росію, як два незалежних, дві незалежних країни. І тільки під час активних фазів протесту у 20-му до початку повномасштабної війни ось ці півтори роки були таким часом одродження, коли і діаспори стали е, активно за межою, і внутрі країни так само люди почали проявляти свою якби, ідентичність, е, ну і вовлі займатися своєю культурою. Але це було всього півтори роки, тобто це та... Вельми мало часу навіть для асенсування того, що відбулося. Ну і нічого не скончилося. Тобто протести притягуються. Політв'язнім у два рази більше у цьому році. І... Ну і русські війська, які зараз у Білорусі. Тому асенсування і нейкі висновок – це тільки, тільки після кінця війни. Зараз у Білорусі тотальний мрак. Тобто у нас зачинені усі незалежні культурні інституції, і я не перебільшую усі. І навіть білоруси зараз саджають у турму за білоруською мовою. Внутрі країни ти не можеш розмовляти на своєму мову. От, і... Ну, у мене зараз не, немає ніяких позитивних прогнозів. То у мене в ogóle питання, чи буде Білорусь після цієї війни чи ні. Thank you. Um I guess cuz both of you um talk a little bit about this idea of I think yeah, sometimes like also like literally the inability to to actually maybe make or produce or even like say, you know, how how can I express in a material way a, a memory when it's also traumatic um and and that's still something that you know it's it's still it's still happening right in the case of what's happening right now um in Ukraine and um in Eastern Europe um so I think maybe going to the last question um just jumping a little bit around you know I'm thinking a lot about Lee about the work you know that you do in, re in regard to commemorative practices um collective trauma you know due to, to do this location repression and again like kind of the epistemological violence, right, that has happened in the past or in the present, you know, in this case. And so, you know, thinking about, um, and then, and also, the, obviously, and I think this is something with also Indigenous peoples, a lot of that violence that maybe happened centuries and today, you know, still affecting generations later, you know, and, and, and internally. Um, 
reverberating between, you know, in, 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 um, in us. And so I think considering what's happening, you know, in the world, you know, how crucial is empathy and care within this type of work, um, within memory archival work, um, whether, you know, it is within an actual archival in institution or practice, you know, maybe in the context where I'm, I'm coming from, but also in terms of with artists, right, as you all are also working with, with, with communities or with, or with other folks and, you know, kind of ask them to kind of share uh, about, you know, and, and do community archiving. So I'd love to hear your perspectives on, on, on this specifically. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say, I would say that empathy is a necessary first step, but I mean, it's just first step and like raw empathy as an emotion, you know, as just this feeling to, to, to be, to be nice to someone. It's, it's not enough. I mean, now, especially when uh, this full-scale invasion, invasion started, we can definitely say that empathy is not enough for understanding because empathy is something very different from understanding. And it's, you know, it's a story, but then uh, you have to develop like real knowledge based on real facts, based on uh, personal maybe interactions with people who can explain what had happened to them, what is happening to them, or what had happened to their uh, ancestors, for example, for like previous generations, because empathy is just very, something very fluid, you know, something in, a, in the air, and it's nice, Thing to say, say even, that like even, I mean, even, even patronizing sometimes also can be very patronizing. Uh, well, yes, yeah. yes, it like, also oh, could be weaponized. You know, I'm so empathetic towards you, but you know, you have to and blah 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 blah. So yeah, so it's just not enough. And I mean, when you look at this uh, pro-Ukrainian initiatives, pro-Ukrainian events, I mean. Uh, I've been in it like since the war started. I mean, I have a record, and my colleagues and friends uh, had even more because I mean, by the so-called public intellectuals, yeah, who are now talking heads uh, in Ukrainian case. Uh, because, and I have this experience and this impression that sometimes, I mean, sometimes, uh, it's you know you. You are empathetic towards someone. You want to give a voice to, to, towards some, like to someone. But okay, what happened next? What is happening with this voice? Is this voice being heard? Is this voice being understood? Uh, do like we as this so-called voice have a real, a real amp, amp, impact? You know, is this a space for real change? You know. So, yeah, for me, it's it's very complicated. I mean, so empathy is, you know, could be could be tricky. <laughs> yeah. um, так, um, могу сказать, что моя, ну, ясно, что мы сталкиваемся с повагой до всех фотоснимков, которые мы собираем, и это выражается у тем, как мы их выкрустовываем. У сенсі ми там нічого не зміняємо, робимо книжки, тобто використовуємо їх з поваги. Ну для мене, наприклад, персональні контакти це вельми складано, і тому вся праця проводиться тільки в форматі онлайн. У мене на даний момент не хапає емпатії, як просто, ну, наприклад, довго розмовляти з людьми про їх сімейну історію, як це було раніше. Зараз я вже просто стараюсь е, мінімізувати комунікацію з людьми до пошти, там, мейла і просто ніякі такі мінімальні переписки у телеграмі. Дякую. Дякую. Right of, of care, maybe better, uh, maybe than empathy. Um, I think just the you know like how 
of the complexities also that kind of that encompasses. But I think maybe thinking about another theme that I found between both of your work, right? This idea also of agency a lot, of agency and of um of sort of like also of action. And, and, and I think Lesia, you know, you talk a lot about the living archive, which I like really love. Um, and so I, I think thinking about the question about, you know, you know, how is an archive positioned, you know, to support or incubate, right? The building of sort of of solidarity amongst one another, relationships amongst one another, you know, and ultimately action, you know, um, you know, whether it is actually action in terms of like, you know, changing policy, you know, thinking about or like laws or, or, you know, or, you know, or even in terms of just like preserving history, which also in itself, you know, it's also um, a challenge in itself. So yeah, I guess um, I'd love to hear about kind of how does that look like for both of you um, in the context of your work? Um, yeah, agency. Зараз питання про комунікацію, так? Ну, в сенсі... Питання про agency. Типу, я не знаю, як це перекласти. Справжність. Типу, справжність тих людей, які, типу, на фотках. Як це використовувати. Але це, типу, це питання, воно там було в цьому. В тому, що нам вислали. Ага, ага, ясно. Це останнє, там, де ти прям, мені здається, що написано, що це питання для тебе. А, ясно, ну, то п'ятий. Sorry, we have technical, yeah. О, окей. Ну, окей. Та я можу сказати, що це питання, якби, у связь поміж поколенням. Это линия просто передачи информации по межпоколениями, которая заховывается в семейных фотоархивах, она как бы у звичайного жити была оборвана. И мне подается, что метой нашего поколения является праца с архивами и обновление вот эту совесть поколен рожных, розных поколений наших батьков, прадедов и так далее. То, с кем мы можем зараз коммуниковать и выстраивать некое совместное уявление нашей штудённости, прошлого, будущего. Вот. И миновито ведущие свою историю, ты можешь ставиться до падей, которые отбываются, а с перспективы уже в опыта в опыту других людей, других поколений, и робить некие логичные основы. Зараз мы отрваны от нашей истории, и тому, мне подается, отбывается то, что зараз отбывается. Например, война с Россией никогда не скончилась в Украине. Так было за все. За все там каждое поколение змагалась і заховувалась, якби старалась заховати себе від імперії. Так само було і в Білорусі. Тобто знищалося це все перманентно. І те, що зараз відбувається, те, що робить герої в Україні, це просто відказ на події сьогоднішнього дня, щоб не передавати це новому поколінню. В Україні люди пам'ятають, що які стосунки вони мали з Росією. На жаль, в Беларуси их это забыли. Тому мне подается, что только, э, только развал империи может значить для нас будущее. Я думаю, я бы хотел сказать не арт-проект, но другой тип проект мы делали вместе с моими друзьями из НГО After Silence. Они собирали орал истории, а также они работали с фотоархивами людей, которые были депортированы в Сибирь из восточной части Украины после Второй мировой войны. Uh, it, this event is largely unknown because, I mean, 
uh, Ukrainian history has so many <laughs> tragedies, deportations, starvations, and all that type of bad stuff that, I mean, <laughs> this deportation was somehow you know, in the shadow. Yeah, but we worked with uh, pictures, like photos, of these people who survived this deportation and then went back to their, like, uh, their home. Uh, so my friends invited me to to find something in this picture to interpret something, somehow what can be seen on this picture or sometimes what is not in there, which is also important. And we found some very interesting cases. For example, I mean, like, people had to survive. It was really tough there. Of course, they want to, like, left uh, in the middle of nowhere with no food and nothing, but, I mean, they had to leave to survive uh, together in some uh, uh, small building uh, with really bad, really, really bad, uh, you know, environment. It, it also it was very cold and uh, the lack of food and basic, uh, basic stuff actually. But when you look at these pictures, you can hardly tell that it was bad. I mean, people are smiling, people are posing in their best clothes. Also, somehow, uh, they all, all or some of them managed to sneak or to, to, to create already their national clothes, which was kind of not very welcomed or prohibited. Uh, also, they managed to perform uh, religious rituals cultural rituals which were pro prohibited uh, by Soviet state, by regime. And also sometimes you can see that people are smiling, that they well dressed, but for example, that men are wearing uh, women's clothes. You know, you can, sometimes you can tell from how buttons mean, right? So that it's like on the wrong side. Everything is nice. Or, or, for example, you can see that uh, women in very nice dresses are posing on a group photos, but sometimes you can see that uh, all dresses or some of them are made from the same fabric because, because it was very limited. You can use what you can get. And in real life situation, in normal real life situation, I can hardly imagine that women would be like glad to pose in same dresses made from same clothes, same fabric. So, I mean, you can tell from the small details that something is very wrong, but it's not obvious. And also what was very interesting, I think also in this kind of identity level, that there are almost no landscape photos in this archive somehow. They took pictures of themselves, of some rituals, or how they work, or how they do something, but it's barely any photos of, you know, forest, or, you know, nice river, or sunset. And also, from their, like, memories, you can uh, tell that they were, like, they wanted to go back. And they wanted to see, you know, uh, trees they had at home, plants they had at home, like animals they had at home, that they perceive this landscape as something foreign, you know? So maybe I'm just, I'm just thinking, maybe they were in conflict with this landscape, with this nature, and they didn't want to picture of it, or maybe it was like limited resource and they just wanted to take pictures of something more important to them, like, their friends or family. Yes, yeah, so. That's like really interesting. Um, just thinking about some archives here in the US about Iranian diasporas that, you know, specifically when the Shah um, came to power, I believe, or, and 
a lot of people had to leave and assume they're going to come back and then couldn't come back. And then a lot of the generations, you know, the kids that are born in the United States or um, found those photographs in suitcases. And they said that a lot of them, specifically from middle class families, found, you know, tons of photographs of um I believe it was like the the a specific lake or specific kind of vacationing spot that it's apparently like a lot of diaspora diasporic Iranians you know kind of had it was like the genre of photograph so I think it's interesting kind of you mentioned this idea of like and you know these are different you know um in in this case people are remembering right like a positive association right of a of a natural uh, nature spot right and in the case you're talking about of folks who are you know were displaced and just couldn't bring themselves to take photos of the landscape uh because of the missing and the nostalgia of what was I guess the landscape back at home so I think even in in um in that kind of what are the patterns of that so I thought that was that was fascinating um uh, I guess being mindful of time, um, I just wanted to ask one last question just to kind of wrap up. Um, and I wanted to go back to question four, um, just to kind of close it up. Um, and basically, I yeah, I think I, it's a very simple question. It just kind of is thinking about what, you know, let me go here. Okay. So kind of, you know, obviously, considering what's happening, taking place right now in Ukraine, taking place right now in Belarus, you know, why is documentation archives so important in this current moment? Um, and I want to attend the conversation on that question and, and that meditation. Uh, so maybe, yeah, less, yeah. Але типу це було до тебе, в сенсі, чому ти вважаєш, що документація архів, типу просто збереження архів і дуже важливе зараз, типу для Білорусі? Та давай йти. Зараз праця архіва з архівом – це праця з нашої історії. Ми працюємо з сімейними архівами, як я вже казала раніше, з якби з одні недоступної інформації, яка у нас є. Ну і так само і не усіх. Те, що зроблено раніше, можна оцінювати. Архів треба зараз, щоб асенсувати свої травми, асенсувати те, що відбувається, відбувалося раніше. Архіви потрібні будуть на відкритих судах і архіви потрібні для будучині. Треба, щоб усі архіви були відкриті, щоб люди не губляли сувість зі своєю історією. Тому зараз ми працюємо з тим, що у нас є, і працюємо на те, щоб архіви були відкриті, щоб люди асенсували їх важність. Я думаю, що зараз відбувається в Україні, це російська інвазія, of Ukraine, I mean, it's obviously a colonial war with clear genocidal intent. And as all colonial wars, it also has the aim of erasing Ukrainian identity. So personal archives also could be perceived as a form of resistance. So like we are very interested in like creating circumstances when these archives can survive, can be digitalized or move to safety. Also, because we need this to like have this continuity of our history, to have this resistance to this, you know, Russian narratives that we don't ever like, you know, real people or real country or real language. So basically, I mean, it's very obvious answer. It's very obvious reaction, but I mean, war sometimes demands really obvious reactions and really obvious actions. So probably it's one of that. And also what Lesia mentioned that we need to document what's happening now in order to, to give uh, like a statement later 
to in order to bear witness to later in order to receive a justice because i think yeah we will do that just we need to strive first um thank you both for um being here today and 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 having this conversation um collective conversation together um and also um appreciate hearing um directly from folks from archivists and memory workers and artists you know directly you know from uh belarus and ukraine specifically since a lot of people talk about that part of the world right now but it's always important to hear specifically from the perspectives of folks who have experienced and are experiencing what's taking place um, over there um, because of Russian colonialism. So thank you both so much uh, just for, for being here. Um, and so I guess, uh, thank you. And thank you all for, for joining us today and, um, and um, looking forward to keeping in touch. <laughs>